evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ann Thompson, the Assistant Director for Public Services at the Essex Library, and I'm honored to welcome you to this evening's talk, Brain Food, the Evolution and Application of Eating. I want to introduce Holly Nelson, Development and Events Manager at the Hotchkiss Library of Sharon. Holly, give a wave. Uh, Hotchkiss Library is partnering with us on the Yale Science Communication Series this spring with the next event scheduled for June 21st, so I hope you'll join us for that. Just a couple of housekeeping notes as you come in and get settled. Please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. We are recording tonight, so you'll be able to see this recording when we put it up on our YouTube channel, hopefully tomorrow. Please put your questions in the chat as you think of them, and we'll get to all of them after both of the presentations. I'm delighted to welcome Shannon Rainsford, who is this evening's Yale Science Communications Coordinator, and she will introduce our speakers. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you, Anne and Holly. Thank you both for hosting us today. Uh, and we're all very excited to be uh, sharing some uh, very interesting science with you guys. Uh, and so the talk of today's topic is brain food, the evolution and application of eating. And before we get into the science, I want to get into the scientists. Uh, and so uh, I want to introduce our two speakers for tonight. Uh, the first is Audrey. Uh, she's a part of Yale's uh, anthropology department. And she researches how our environment and history have contributed to differences in the genes of modern day human population. So how has our past impacted our present and possibly future? Uh, and a fun fact about her, and I love this fun fact, uh, is that on a field dig in Oklahoma, she helped to butcher an entire bison using stone tools, uh, <laughs> which I think is absolutely wild and crazy uh, and definitely is a fun fact. Uh, and then our second speaker for tonight is Grace, uh, who's a part of the cell biology department at Yale. And she studies how things move inside the brains of worms. Uh, and hopefully this can give us a little bit of insight into how our brains as humans work. Uh, and a fun fact about her is that she runs a game of Dungeons and Dragons every week for other graduate students at Yale. And so, uh, now I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about uh, background um, and, oops, sorry. So humans have evolved over time, uh, but not only have we evolved, but our diets have evolved. Uh, so our early human ancestors used to scavenge around for food, uh, trying to find these uh, tubers, uh, meats and whatever we can get, as well as wheats. Uh, but nowadays, we can pick up a Sally's Pizza anytime. We have access to so many different types of food. And with all these different choices, we often think, what is a good diet? Uh, and how has our uh, length of diet um, impacted us as well as on a long term and a shorter term? And so... Uh, to talk a little bit more about this, we have Audrey who will be talking to us about how our diet has changed as we have changed over time. And Grace will be uh, gracing us uh, with how our diet can change parts of our body, specifically our brain. And so with that, uh, Audrey, I would like for you to talk a little bit more. Great. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Audrey and give me just a second here to share my screen. All right, so I hope everyone can see this full screen now. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of the human diet. Um, so we're going to kind of go through this journey through time um, of changes that have happened in the human diet and how they continue to affect us today. So there are going to be two parts to this talk. Uh, the first is going through our ancestral diet, what our ancestors ate, how this changed over time. Um, and then the second part is going to look into what are some of the modern adaptations that we can still see in modern populations, um, and then how did diet lead to these current day differences. So first, before we get into kind of this change in diet over time, um, I wanted to establish how diet relates to us. Why do we care about diet beyond just the food that we eat? 
Um, and there are several uh, major hypotheses in anthropology that suggest that major changes in human evolution are actually tied to changes in our diet. Um, so by changing our diet, we were then able to evolve and change over time. So one of these uh, big picture ideas is that by changing from foods that don't give us a lot of nutrients um, and don't, don't give us a lot of energy like uh, grasses or bark, for example, to something more like meat, which is uh, what we call higher quality and that it gives us more nutrients and we can get more energy out of it. That allowed humans to have more energy to do things um, like our daily activities and growing bigger bodies. And one major advancement is of course, growing our large brains. Um, so humans are known for, very heavy, uh, for having very, very large brains compared to our body size. Right. So then uh, for some additional context, I also wanted to discuss some of these human ancestors that we're going to be discussing in this talk. Um, so we can see that humans are all the way up here. Um, we're at the top of this tree. Uh, we are Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens is thought to have appeared kind of around where this red arrow is. So about 300,000 years ago is when we start seeing the earliest uh, Homo sapiens. But then we have this entire tree of our ancestors. So we have, yes. So we have uh, at the very bottom of the tree here, this is Artipithecus. So they are um, believed to be at the base of our tree. These are the first uh, species that we say are on the human tree. So at this point, um, about five to six million years ago, um, human ancestors are still pretty chimp-like, living in the trees and pretty small bodies and brains. Then we have Australopithecus, so we're moving up in time now to about three to five million years ago. And Australopithecus is starting to become larger bodied, we have larger brains, where uh, some of the uh, members of Australopithecus are walking more on two legs instead of living in the trees. And then we have Paranthropus. Um, who we're going to discuss a little bit later on. Um, these are actually not really related to us. They're probably uh, kind of like distant cousins. Um, at some point, they all died out, so there are no living Paranthropus today, but we were at some point related. And then finally, we have our Homo group. Um, so these are most closely related to us, and this is ranging from about 2 million years ago to, of course, us today. And we're going to discuss some of the changes that are going on in these groups over time. So uh, this is a timeline of some major points in human diet. Um, I do want to preface this by saying there are a lot of changes that are occurring across this timeline, but we're just focusing in on um, the major dietary changes that occurred. And we're going to be talking about things like meat eating, fire use, cooking, and how this all changed uh, Homo sapiens over, or, or our ancestors and Homo sapiens over time. And first, I wanted to focus on these two points. So as we saw in the tree, uh, humans and great apes um, split about six to seven million years ago. That's when we first see uh, what is believed to be our earliest ancestors. And then by 2.5 to 3 million years ago is when we see this first major change, which is evidence of meat eating. So our human ancestors uh, at this time, around 3 to 5 million years ago, changed our environment. So when we see chimps and gorillas today, they live in this forested environment. Um, and they eat things like tree bark, leaves, uh, some fruits. Um, so it's a little bit different than what we see in modern day humans. But at this time, we see a movement for uh, human ancestors from this forested area to more of an open grassland savanna environment. Um, and with this movement, it also gave us access to different types of food. And what's interesting is that around the same time, we see a change in behavior as well, where we see human ancestors starting to make tools. So this is actually a picture of some of the oldest tools that have ever been found. They're 3 million years old. Um, and we can see they don't look very sophisticated. They're just kind of uh, like rocks with the uh, sharp edges. Um, but by about 2 million years ago, um, we start seeing uh, a major advancement in tool technology, 
where um, some of our human ancestors are making these tools that have really sharp edges um, and they can be used for things like this, um, like scavenging meat. So now that we're out in this open grassland area, there's um, more instances where we can come into contact with uh, larger animals like um, the ancestors of elephants, for example, or um, these, these larger bodied animals. And so we probably were not hunting at this time because humans are still pretty small bodied, um, but we were probably finding dead animals um, and then using these tools to crush bones or cut meat off of the bone. And we can actually see this in the, fo in the fossil record um, where we find bones around that 2 million year time point that have cut marks on them. And then another potential use for these tools uh, would have been to dig up tubers. So things like potatoes and yams, which like meat are um, a huge source of energy, um, just like carbs today. Right. So that was this kind of uh, first uh, 6 million to 3 million years. That's what was occurring in, uh, in terms of diet at that point. And then now we're jumping forward. And again, remembering that there's a lot of events that are happening um, in between, but these are the major dietary events. So by about 1.8 to 1.5 million years, we see the first fire use. And then by 780,000 years, there's some evidence of cooking. So this is the next major advancement um, in terms of human diet. So when we start seeing the first fire use, humans were probably not controlling um, fire at this point, but what we were doing um, was maybe being attracted to fire. Um, so out in the savannas of Africa, there are often lightning storms and wildfires that are occurring. So it's possible that as a result of these lightning storms, we might have seen uh, dead animals or nests that are abandoned and early human ancestors could have been attracted to these uh, fiery areas for those extra food resources. So likely this is how fire use started. But then by that uh, 780, 800,000 years ago time, we start seeing some controlled use of fire. So this is an example of a burnt seed uh, from a site just outside of Africa. And it's dated to about 780,000 years ago. And there are lots of other seeds at this site, which suggests that now humans are using fire to actually burn things. So we're controlling it. And then by about 400,000 years ago, um, all throughout Africa and outside of Africa and Asia and uh, Europe, there are fire or evidence of fire um, pretty much everywhere. So by 400,000 years ago, fire had become a really, really important part of uh, the life of our human ancestors. And the reason why we care about fire use is because of its use in cooking. So cooking makes food a lot easier for our bodies to break down. Um, if we were eating, oh, sorry, foods like this, right? Like raw wheat, it doesn't give us much in terms of nutrients. We might as well be eating cardboard um, for all the energy that it takes to break it down and what we get out of it. But by cooking food, for example, like this, these are wheat berries, we can actually change how digestible it is and how easy it is for us to get nutrients and energy out of it. So there was this study done that showed that there was actually a change in how digestible wheat is and it, in, it increases by about 34% um, once we start cooking. So then it's much easier for us to get energy and nutrients out of it. And what's really interesting is that when we now look at the um, skeleton, skeleton of uh, us and our ancestors, we can really see a change um, that appears to be attributed to cooking. So we can see that humans have adapted to a cooked diet and we'll go through this in greater detail, but in our teeth, in our skulls, um, we can really see this change. So first focusing on the teeth, um, if you take a look at the back teeth here, so this is Australopithecus afarensis, this uh, larger uh, bottom jawbone here, and then this is a Homo sapiens jawbone. And if you look at the size of the teeth, Australopithecus has these gigantic back teeth, whereas Homo sapiens are quite small. And it's been hypothesized that Australopithecus needed these big back teeth because they weren't cooking food. Um, so if you've ever tried to, you know, bite down on some grass or like raw wheat, as we saw on the last slide, it's very hard to actually break down. So you need to grind it down. So they needed these large teeth because they weren't cooking. 
And there are additional uh, changes as well when we look at the skull. So this again is Australopithecus, the same as the teeth we just saw. This is Paranthropus. So remember, these are our distant cousins that no longer um, exist. There are no living Paranthropus today. And then this is a Homo sapien skull. And we'll take a look at some differences here. So the first thing um, to focus on is this lower jawbone. And you might notice in the humans here how skinny um, and small our jawbone is compared to these two. So remember, these two are living in a time before really uh, heavy fire use. Then the next change we see is <clears throat> if you take a look at the tops of their heads here, the human head is actually quite flat. But if you take a look at these two, they have this kind of point at the top of their head. And you can kind of see a ridge along the side here. And then the final feature is this arch on the side of our face. So again, in humans, quite skinny. And then in these two, they have a thick arch. So it's been hypothesized that all of these different features in these two um, were necessary for muscles to attach to um, because they had to do so much heavy chewing and grinding on their food to break it down. Um, if you didn't have these features, it would cause too much stress. Um, whereas in humans, because we've adapted to eat this softened cooked food, we no longer needed uh, to develop these really large jaw bones and different uh, skeletal features. So it's a really interesting uh, <clears throat> example of how we can see this change in the skeleton over time. All right, and then, so this has all been leading up um, to now we're looking at the earliest Homo sapiens where this uh, yellow bar is here. So you can think of these as kind of incremental changes um, that have really been able to increase how much energy humans are taking in over time. And then the final thing I'd like to <clears throat> talk about is farming. So we can see there's a major leap in time here. Now we're looking at 20,000 to 12,000 years ago. Um, but this again is a huge, huge change in the human lifestyle. So with farming, um, humans stopped uh, hunting and gathering, and now we've kind of changed this lifestyle where we're staying in one place, and we picked one or two crops and decided to raise them, so our diet is much less varied. Um, but what was useful about farming is that now we have so much energy coming in because we have a stable food supply um, that our population is really able to grow. And because we made this massive transition, it, this could have been an additional pressure um, for some of these traits related to diet, like our, our body size or um, things related to, to diet. Okay, so these have all been um, this kind of change over time that uh, continues to affect us today. So now that we've looked at how diet has led us to this point, um, I wanted to look at a specific example of how there are differences in diet um, around the world, and then how that actually has a, a visible effect that we can see in our, um, in, in modern day populations. And the specific example that we're going to look at um, has to do with fats. Um, so you might've seen something like this pyramid before, it's kind of a simple food pyramid, um, where you know I think we're often told you have to have a balanced diet of grains and cereals, fruits and proteins, um, but then often I think we're told you can't eat too much fats and sugars. These aren't good for you. Um, but what we really find um, is that there are so many different types of fats in particular, um, and some of them are quite healthy. Um, so things like olive oils, uh, nuts, avocado oil, um, and all of these fats do different things. So we actually do need to be eating these fats because they play uh, an integral role in our body. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about these different types of fats um, in Grace's talk. Uh, but what we're going to focus on here is the building blocks of these fats. And these are known as fatty acids. So we can think of fatty acids as forming these um, chain-like structures. So just like we see here, they link together. Um, they're kind of repeating units that link together. And there's different kinds of uh, fatty acids in our food. So some of them form, form a short chain. 
fatty acids. And these can be found in the foods you see in these pictures here. So like eggs, meat, um, leafy greens, and then nuts and seeds. And besides these, we can also have long chain fatty acids. Um, so just like their name, now we're having much more linkage. So these, they're forming uh, these longer lengths. And what's interesting is that these are not found in the same types of food. Instead, we can find long chain fatty acids in foods that come from aquatic resources. So like our oceans, rivers, and lakes. So things like seaweed, fish, uh, clams, shrimp, um, and even mammals like whales and seals that come from uh, like the ocean. And the reason why we care about these different types of fatty acids is that they each play specific roles in our body. So one role of these long chain fatty acids is um, in our brain. They're really necessary for our brain, which you'll hear again a lot more about in Grace's talk, different types of these long chain fatty acids. Um, <clears throat> but because our brains need this, you might think, uh, well, what if my diet doesn't have enough of um, that aquatic food? Right? What if I, I can't eat a lot of fish? Um, and what we found is that our bodies actually have ways of making these long chain fatty acids. So we have a gene called FADS. And here we can really think of a gene as just like an operating system for our body. Our body can read these genes and then it knows what it has to do and what it has to make for us to function normally. So what this FADS gene was found to do is that it takes those short fatty acid chains and can elongate them. So it makes this enzyme and we can think of an enzyme as just something that has one very specific purpose. So this FADS enzyme takes these little fatty acid units, it'll pick them up and then find a short chain fatty acid and connect them. So we've now changed that short chain into a long chain. So now it can do a, the job that uh, long chain fatty acids do. And in this case, make up part of the brain. So then scientists wanted to look deeper into this FADS gene. Um, because we know that there are differences in diet around the world. Some people have access to fish and some people don't. And when they looked deeper into this FADS gene, they found some differences in people around the world. So let's think of these two people here as having version one of the gene. And version one is just, they have this purple stripe in this one location. And what version one does is that it produces one copy of that FADS enzyme, and then that one FADS enzyme can do the job of creating uh, one long fatty acid. Meanwhile, these two have a red stripe at that same location. So they have version two. And with version two, they can make two copies of the FADS. And these two copies can do a lot more work. So maybe they can make uh, three long chain fatty acids instead of the one. So now we see this uh, difference in, in how efficient um, the FADS is working. Um, so now you might be thinking, why would we want this, right? Since our brains need these long chain fatty acids, wouldn't everyone want to have this and produce more? So to answer the question as to why this might be useful version one, um, we have to look back at diet. And a specific uh, case study to look at are the Inuit people. So this study in 2015 decided to look at the Inuit people. And if you know anything about the Inuit, you might know that they live up in this Arctic area where it's very hard to grow any types of crops. So their diet is very, very dependent on um, the animal life around them. And it's very fat heavy. So they eat a lot of things like whale, um, fish, and seal, all of which are fat heavy foods. And then they compared this Inuit diet um, to a European diet. So um, Europeans have a, a more varied diet. They have access to things like breads and pasta, um, again, still some fish and meat, and then uh, leafy greens, vegetables, and fruits. So it's this really different diet. So they wanted to see what was unique in the Inuit population compared to this European diet. And they found that with fads, um, it really helped make up for that fat heavy diet that we see in the Inuit people. So if you recall back to that version one and two, they found that a lot of Inuit had that version one that was less efficient. Um, but with the Inuit, because they're eating so much fat, they actually don't need to be very efficient. 
And they found the Inuit that had that version one of the gene actually had uh, lower weights. And along with those lower weights, there was less risk uh, for things like um, heart disease or high cholesterol. So it seems that this, this difference in the FADS gene um, was really helping to make up for the diet that the Inuit people have in comparison um, to what we see in Europeans, which have more of this uh, version two. So then now that they found this in one specific population, some other scientists wanted to look at this around the world. So again, keep in mind, we have version one that's not as efficient. It produces less long chain fatty acid. And then we have version two, which is more efficient um, and it produces more long chain fatty acid. So we have uh, purple and red. And this exact pattern is actually what they saw all around the world. So if we look up here, this is that Inuit population that has a lot of that purple, that version one. And then we see the same pattern with a lot of these places that are living um, very close to the water. So places like Indonesia, for example, um, and these populations are eating a lot of fish. They also have very high numbers of that version one. Whereas areas like this in Africa, where they're a little bit more landlocked and they don't have a lot of access um, to you know, like aquatic resources, they have a lot more of this version two, and their bodies are much more efficient at actually just making these long chain fatty acids on their own. So it's this very interesting, um, noticeable difference in populations that's based on diet. So in conclusion, I hope this, this showed you that food is really much more than just the things that we eat. It's actually influenced our evolution over time. It's changed our skeletal structure. It's changed our genes. Um, and then humans have really evolved to eat this balanced diet of fats and starches and meats. Um, and in cases like the Inuit where we don't have access to it, our bodies and our genes reflect that. They have actually changed um, and evolved to help make up for that. All right, so now that um, we've gone through this timeline of human diet, um, Grace is now going to take you more to the modern day. Um, so we're gonna focus on shorter term change now that we've looked at all this long-term change. And we're gonna look at different types of fats, um, what makes up these fats, and then the role that they play um, in different functions in our body. So thank you. And I'll uh, hand it off to Grace. Thank you, Audrey. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. Audrey, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen, okay? Great, all right, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to follow up on Audrey's talk with a little bit more focus on the, uh, the cell biology of eating and talk about how uh, what we eat affects our bodies, uh, focusing on fat and how it affects the brain. So to get started, uh, let me uh, echo Audrey um, in saying that during evolution, we went through many diets, um, but it took us millions of years to kind of uh, adapt to the challenges of our environment, to um, be able to take in different kind of nutrients and access them um, in our environment. And that was, I think, a really slow, really gradual process. However, in the modern day, um, because of global trade, we can dramatically change our diet um, from day to day or from hour to hour. Unfortunately, you know, being having that freedom also can make it more challenging to stay balanced in what we eat. And I think that's something um, we all have to be kind of mindful of and uh, focused on because it's so easy to become unbalanced. Um, and as an example, I'm going to talk about myself. So extremes are bad for your body. Um, so I'm a graduate student. And graduate students work a lot of hours. So I often am in the lab and I've done some, some research on my worms and I'm tired. And, you know, maybe I'm feeling a bit down. Or I'm kind of hungry. And so I have a Snickers. And one Snickers is not bad. It's okay. It's 100%. Basically, I think anything your, your body is okay with in, in moderation. So even though, you know, candy, we know we're not supposed to eat candy one candy every once in a while, no big deal. However, unfortunately, I, I end up eating candy for dinner really depressingly often. 
<laughs> and that's really bad. Like that's always something where I'm just like really hungry and I make this kind of bad choice um, out of desperation. And then afterwards, I maybe I'm not like incredibly hungry, but generally I just you know feel bad both like physically and also kind of about myself. So this sort of um, really extremely unhealthy uh, diet extreme uh, is not good for me. So you can be healthier kind of overall, but also just feel better um, if you have balance in your diet, if you're seeking um, a variety of food sources, um, which again, thanks to that global trade, it's sort of easier than ever to be having uh, lots of different fruits and vegetables and protein sources and lentils and grains from all over the world and whatever um, you end up enjoying and liking. Now, to emphasize how important these things are to your body, I'm actually going to focus on just one nutrient, fat, and I'm going to talk about how uh, specifically it affects your brain on a um, cell biology level, and I'm also going to emphasize how we need a variety of different kinds of fat for our brain. So to get started, I mean, obviously your brain is incredibly important. It's controlling, you know, your, your ability to interact with your environment and your ability to see the world and listen to this talk. Um, but I think um, one really amazing thing about your brain is your brain is actually 50% fat. Um, fat is incredibly important to your brain and your brain needs many, many, many different kinds of fat to function properly. Um, talking about this key brain nutrient, I'm going to talk to you guys um, about the types of fats and just a little bit about fat chemistry. So to talk about fat chemistry, I'm going to introduce just a few things. So um, when I, there's a C, that stands for carbon, H stands for hydrogen, and O stands for oxygen. If you have a saturated fat, which is a word you prob probably heard before, and I'll talk more about saturated fats later, um, what that means is a saturated fat has a certain shape, and that determines its function. So the shape of a saturated fat always has at one end a small group that has oxygens. Those are the O's. And then it has this long chain um, that has a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. And you can notice here these two lines. This is a, um, a double bond. Um, and that's going to show up later. This is a, um, a closer interaction between this oxygen and this carbon. Now, an unsaturated fat here at the bottom, I've drawn, I drew my little cartoon in this shape because that's actually the physical shape of an unsaturated fat. An unsaturated fat has a double bond not only on this little um, end group, but also um, somewhere in the middle. And it can have more than one, but it only needs one to be called an unsaturated fat. And that actually causes it to physically bend and that affects its function. Um, but it'll still have this small group with oxygen. So basically you can recognize um, chemically any fat because it's always going to have this characteristic small group with oxygens and then a tail which may have a double bond or it may not. So having described a little bit of the chemistry of unsaturated fats and saturated fats, I want to emphasize that we need both unsaturated and saturated fats for our bodies to function. So saturated fats um, are generally the kind of fat we think of as being found in meat. Um, again, this long tail of the saturated fat has only single bonds, um, and it's called saturated because it has the maximum possible number of hydrogens. Um, saturated fats are very stiff and stable molecules, and that's important in your body. Your body needs to have some stiffness to it. Um, and generally, saturated fats are solid um, at room temperature. So you get a lot of your saturated fat um, from meat and from some vegetables, for example, um, if you guys know coconut oil, coconut oil, unlike most other plant uh, fats, is solid at room temperature, and that's a uh, kind of a hint that it's a saturated fat. Now, the unsaturated fat, which is any fat that has a double bond on somewhere in its tail, um, it's a, a bent molecule, and that is actually going to make it um, appear as a liquid at room temperature. So it's kind of this uh, classic plant fat. Um, and it's also in a lot of these uh, fish fats that Audrey talked about. Now, um, although I'm going to avoid making um, diet recommendations in my talk because I'm not a medical doctor, um, I will say I think the evidence pretty strongly suggests that 
um, the, the, uh, the let's, let's say best fat for you is the omega-3 fatty acid. And this is like um, an unsaturated fat, but it's super bent. Like you can see it has a lot of double bonds. So it's like a, it's a, it's a very unsaturated, unsaturated fat. Um, and it tends to be really long. And you um, can get a lot of omega-3 fatty acids from fish. And some people will take these uh, fish oil capsules to get even more omega-3 fatty acids. Um, however, although I, I, um, I talked about how the research suggests that omega-3 fatty acids are generally good for us, our body needs both kinds of fat. And you can think about it is that bodies need to be both flexible, which would be the unsaturated um, fat, and sturdy, which would be the saturated fat. We are not liquids at room temperature, um, so we need to have some kind of stability to us, and we end up getting a, a balance of both of these kinds of fats. Now I'm going to talk about some of the different saturated and unsaturated fats our body uses um, and just sort of introduce you to some of these terms. So I'm going to start with the phospholipids. Um, phospholipids, let me break this name down. Phospho just means it contains the element phosphorus. Lipid means fat, um, and that's going to appear in names a lot. So phospholipids are the fundamental component of all cell membranes. Um, so every single cell in your body it's gonna have this layer of phospholipids around it. And phospholipids actually look like fingers that are interlaced together. And some of the fingers are unsaturated and others are saturated um, in order to perform different functions. And they end up forming what's called the phospholipid bilayer um, around the outside of your cells. And that's gonna kind of seal your cells off from the outside environment and protect them from challenges. And because it's both unsaturated and saturated, it can have both some structural stability and some flexibility. Next, I'll talk about sphingolipids. So I love sphingolipids. Uh, the tire will make more sense in a minute. Um, first off, the name sphingolipid, sphingo is, stands for sphinx like and it means mysterious and the reason that it has this name is sphingolipids were one of the latest lipids to be um, studied and discovered and so here's a picture of the uh, of the sphinx in Egypt and lipid again just means fat and the reason I chose this um, tire picture is because the sphingolipid um, is really wrapping around the cells you would imagine the the cell is the inside of the wheel and then the um, the sphingolipid would be kind of the outside tire and sphingolipids, kind of like the rubber of a tire, are really stiff and resistant, and they're produced from saturated fat. So this would be an example of how um, saturated fat is used for your body. And I also want to show you a picture. I'm not really going to go into this, but this is an example. Sphingolipids really actually do kind of look like a tire around the central thing. So this, this structure here, this... Um, kind of corrugated cardboard looking structure. This would be a whole bunch of sphingolipids and also some other things. And then in the center is actually a cell. So it, it really does look like this. Next, I'll talk about the glycolipid. Glycolipids are very simple. Glyco means sugar and lipid means fat. So this is just a fat with a sugar attached. Um, and this sugar acts as an ID card to tell the body that this is your cell. Um, glycolipids are very saturated fats. Um, but they're also really short. So they're like very short, stiff molecules. And you would get them on the outside of your lipid bilayer. Um, and that would be identifying um, your cell, telling your immune system that it belongs and not to attack it. So of course, it's incredibly important for the function of your body. And then finally, cholesterol. So cholesterol's name is totally different than the other fats I mentioned. That's because cholesterol is a bit weird. Um, Coal means from the liver. And esterol means an alcohol group, which is just more oxygen than hydrogen. Um, but this is still a fat. Um, cholesterol is this incredibly important cell support structure. So most of the time cholesterol comes up, it's, it's sort of doing what it's not supposed to do, where it's instead of protecting your cell, it's kind of gotten outside the cell um, and it's forming these, these walls where there are not supposed to be any walls and it's blocking your blood flow. So that, that's sort of the, um, the bad version of cholesterol, but it's what it's supposed to do. And what it's doing almost all the time is it's actually protecting your cell like a suit of chainmail armor. And the reason I've chosen chainmail for my metaphor is this is a extremely weird fat that actually makes a ring shape. So you can imagine all these rings of cholesterol um, all around your cell, and that's protecting your cell 
um, and keeping it intact. So going back out, I mentioned at the start of my talk, I was going to talk about how these fats are important for your brain. So the reason your brain depends on fat is your brain cells are absolutely huge compared to every other cell in your body. So let's think about the standard cell in the body. The standard cell is like that big, OK? So it's 0. 0.00000. Did I miss a zero? It's very, very small. It's very, very, very small. It's smaller than a speck of dust. You cannot see it, OK? Um, Many of you are probably familiar with the sciatic nerve. Um, I have back problems. I'm very familiar with the sciatic nerve. Uh, and the sciatic nerve is many feet long. It's thousands or tens of thousands of times bigger than any other cell in your body. And your sciatic nerve is one cell, one single cell that is many feet long. And you can imagine such an incredibly long cell is going to need some awesome support structure. So your nerves have to work a lot as you live your life. If you think again about the sciatic nerve, and you're going about your life and you're walking, the sciatic nerve is bending in the middle. It's having a lot of forces um, put onto it. It's got to bend and bend and never break or you'll lose the function of your leg. So how is it going to be able to kind of survive this pressure? Um, so it's going to use a combination of these sturdy saturated fats, and these very flexible unsaturated fats um, in or order to survive um, having to constantly bend. Um, so going through these fats specifically, for, and for example, how they would help your sciatic nerve. If you think about the phospholipid, I told you it forms the cell membrane and it's flexible. The sphingolipid is going to protect the nerve and it's sturdy. The glycolipid is labeling the nerve so you don't have an autoimmune disorder. It's small but sturdy. And the cholesterol is protecting the nerve. And cholesterol, because of its very weird uh, ring shape, can be both flexible and sturdy, depending on the situation. So all these fats are kind of working together um, to allow your nerves to function. So I talked a lot about um, some of the different fats in the brain. And I told you about the chemistry of fat. So you can um, identify a fat based on its chemical structure. And I told you about the properties of fats. But one question you might have is like, how do we know that these fats are in the brain? Like, how do we, how do we actually know that these fats do anything? And we figured that out using a technique called lipidomics. So lipid just means fat, and omics is big data. So it's um, measurements from many different groups. And what that gives us is it gives us an idea of the fractions of each kind of fat that are in the brain. And so to figure out the lipidome of the brain, which is just the, um, the fat fraction for an individual brain, um, Again, so lipid meaning fat, O oh, meaning complete set. You take your brain, well, not your brain. You, you take a mouse's brain. And what you do is you cut this brain into many pieces. You're going to separate all the different sections of the brain. I think there's one more. Yes. And once you've cut the brain into a bunch of pieces, um, you do all kinds of fancy things to each piece. And then um, you're eventually able to measure exactly how much lipid is in each slice. And once you are able to measure exactly how much lipid is in each slice, you can then do experiments and see how it changes. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this, I thought, really fascinating experiment on how does diet change what fats are in the brain. So the way this experiment worked is they fed three special diets to either uh, adult mice or pups. Um, so these three diets were fish oil capsules, which is high in omega-3 fatty acid, safflower oil, which is an unsaturated fat, and beef tallow, or just beef fat, which is a saturated fat. And I will remind you again of those three things. So they're basically going to test all the different kinds of fats that I introduced in my presentation. And they want to see if they feed the mice um, diets that are rich in each of these fat sources, how does that change the fat in the brain? So the way that they interpreted their data is they got something called a heat map. Um, so to interpret a heat map, all you need to know is that darker color means that you have more of something, and lighter color means you have less of it. So this kind of dark reddish brown means you have more of something, and this uh, light yellow means you have less of it. So they ended up getting data like this. So at the top left, this would be diet A, um, and it's very dark red for fat one. That means diet A produces more of fat one. And then for diet B on the bottom left, it's more yellow. So that's suggesting um, that diet B 
is producing less of fat one in the mice brain. Um, so from this, they were able to draw the conclusion that diet A leads to more of fat one than diet B. And they did this for hundreds of different kinds of fat in the brain. And their overall conclusion, which I think was really cool and really important, is that they can change in weeks the proportions of fats in the brain just by changing the diet. And this is very different um, from Audrey's work, uh, which is showing how um, kind of the brain and even the whole body is changing based on diet over millions of years. You, we don't need millions of years, we need weeks, okay? Um, so as we can think that, you know, as we evolved, our diets changed very slowly um, but they did change over millions of years, and that changed our, our brains and our bodies. It made us smarter. I mean, it changed our mouths, it changed our skulls, it changed everything about us. Um, but we can also make on a very short time scale, uh, big changes, maybe not so obvious as like our bones changing, but you can change actually the fat that's in your brain. Um, and by choosing a diverse diet, you can make sure you're supplying your brain with everything it needs to face the uh, challenges of life. So thank you all so much for your uh, time and attention. I'm excited to take your questions. I am a neuroscientist, a cell biology neuroscientist. Thank you, Grace. That was, um, that was, uh, uh, <laughs> I think we're probably all trying to metabolize what you, <laughs> But you just said, I have a lot of questions about the Snickers. So um, I'm just being honest. Yeah. Holly, do you want to go ahead and take the questions in the chat? Sure, I will be happy to um to read those. Um I, although some of them actually one of the earlier ones uh was actually for um Audrey and it was from Grace, and I thought it was a terrific question. And and so maybe that'll get the conversation going where she asked, um, are some tools more common for different areas? For instance, are early humans digging up tubers in all, con in all continents or is this before the migration out of Africa? Is that something you wanna take Audrey, take on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of the times that I was talking about, um, that would be, before the migration out of Africa, um, quite quite a bit earlier before that. Um, in terms of within Africa itself, most tools are found in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and I honestly think that this doesn't mean that these are the only areas where humans were digging up tubers or scavenging. Um, I think it's actually just uh, a bias in where people look. Um, so there's a lot of anthropology that going back decades has focused in Eastern Africa and Southern Africa, because these are areas where it's very easy for things to preserve. There's a lot of caves in South Africa. Um, and then there's the Great Rift Valley in East Africa, where it's um, easier to have access to these like old, old layers of earth. Um, so I think that there are probably some differences, um, but just of what we see in the, the fossil record, um, it's just not uh, knowable yet. Maybe it could be that we have uh, a lot more findings in the future. Sure, just because uh, I think it's an interesting point. We find stuff there. We know things exist there because it's fairly relatively easy to look there as opposed to other places where you're not as likely to have access. Mm -hmm. And there's another question also for your presentation um, that we had one answer from an audience member, but also, um, the question was, can I change my fads from red to purple by changing my diet? Yeah, so I think um, this uh, response by Ann Saunders, thank you, Ann, <laughs> um, was actually a, a perfect response. So yes, uh, the, the fads gene is something that's coming from um, our ancestry. Um, so it, it's not really something that you can change over the course of your lifetime. Um, that it, it is really tied to your population history um, and, you know, kind of the foods that your ancestors were eating. Um, so unfortunately, no, we cannot change it over the course of a lifetime. But as you might be able to see in Grace's presentation, um, there's still a lot of changes that we can make on that short term. Sure. Good. That was great. That's interesting. A good answer. Thank you. Um, a question for Grace from Anne. And um, I think it's probably something we were all thinking about. So thank you for asking it, Anne. Grace, has your research changed the way you eat when you have time for something besides Snickers? I think my research makes me feel more guilty. <laughs> um, 
I, I've always thought it's a funny contrast, you know, I'm a biologist, I theoretically, I know a ton about the body and what I should do. And yet, somehow, all that knowledge does not stop me from eating ice cream and cake. So it may, yeah. be, a whole, <laughs> it, it may be a whole different part of anthropology, but um, or, or neurobiology or molecular something, but oh, yeah, I mean, it's all based on desire. That shows that certain things we get addicted to very readily, not addicted to, but that they're so much more attractive, even though part of our brain says, don't do that. And you just sort of say, well, stop me, right? I mean, I don't know, that's obviously not quite in your field, but. Um, I've always loved, like um, one of my favorite things, there's this Seinfeld episode. Um, to, uh, the, Jerry is talking about like losing your appetite, how your parents always tell you, oh, you can't, you can't eat all those cookies. You're gonna lose your appetite. And Jerry's like, well, now I'm an adult. I'll eat all the cookies I want. Uh, I, I identify with that a lot. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, um, choosing, choosing a good diet is really hard. Um, I think science makes it sound really easy. Like, you know, if we just, I think probably based on science, if we all ate a Mediterranean diet, we would be great. Um, or, but it's, you know, life is really hard and there's a lot of stress and pressure and we've evolved to really like fat and sugar and those things make us feel happy. Um, so the challenge of trying to fight your like base animal desire for ice cream, I think is, is really high. Um, and so that's why, um, I don't know, you know I, I don't really feel equipped to, to judge anybody because I'm not perfect, um, I, even though I, I, I should know better. I have a direct question that might help you uh, sure. put off your ice cream and Snickers tonight. Uh, I got one directly from a no, member um, to Audrey. If rotting food, they're curious if rotting food, how did they eat that large animal fast enough influence diet choices or how, how did our bodies evolve to adapt to spoiled food? Um, and then with refrigeration, are we evolving away from that kind of resiliency? Uh, yeah, so in terms of the uh, of our past, um, that is actually how this hypothesis has changed over time. So at first people thought maybe um, we were using it to, to cut meat off the bone. Um, and I think recently now the thought has changed to maybe we were um, trying to crush these bones to actually get it like bone marrow inside the bone um, be, just because of that. Um, before fire, there's so much bacteria um, on the surface uh, of these bones, that would not have been good for us. Um, but obviously, it's also very, very hard to you know, ever know um, what like stomach contents of a uh, a past human would be. Like maybe we could look at a chimp and gorilla for um, an example. Like they are totally fine with eating, you know, like raw monkey meat, for example. But uh, we probably could not. Um, so it could be that there could that could have been also a change that occurred over time. Um, that we just don't know about yet. Yeah, um, and in terms of the refrigeration, I'm actually not uh, totally sure about that. Um, I think in terms of like when we talk about evolutionary traits. So um, I might talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting as food, as food and food access changes and food preservation changes, probably many people have heard of the microbiome. Um, I used to, I used to do bacteria stuff back in undergrad, so I know a little bit about this. Um, I think our, um, you know, we, we live with bacteria in our bodies and those bacteria are helping with our digestion. Um, and you can hear, you know, this is more like anecdotal stuff, but if you're, if you're from a country that doesn't have great food hygiene, often you can tolerate extremes that other people can't. And you may not be incredibly genetically different, but maybe you've grown up with these um, bacteria and these bacteria are, um, you can think of it almost as like the bacteria have kind of settled a town and these like people move into town and they're kind of trying to muscle in and the bacteria kind of fight the good back your, your friendly neighborhood bacteria fight them off but if you don't have any tough friendly neighborhood bacteria maybe you get um, invaded so i think um there's a lot of really interesting research being done on like for example like what is the microbiome of elite athletes um and how how does that relate to their performance um, and I think that's going to be increasingly important. One of the biggest health challenges right now, um, there's this incredibly dangerous um, anaerobic bacteria called Clostridium difficile or C. diff. And it's very, very um, prevalent in hospital settings. It's incredibly hard to kill. It's incredibly hard to, um, it's resistant to bleach and to alcohol. Um, but one of the most effective ways to treat C. diff is actually um, getting good bacteria. 
Um, and I, I used to work with C. diff and I actually, I, I had to leave that job because I had to take antibiotics for a, a different infection. And because I had taken antibiotics, I killed all my good bacteria and then I, I became vulnerable to C. diff. Um, so I think it's just really interesting topic. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, another question from Deborah here uh, on uh, saying this very interesting research. How can this be applied to food intake of groups of people who do not have access to, to varied diet because of economic or sociological factors? And um, so I. Yeah. Oh. Yes, I think um, one possible approach, um, and this is actually something that uh, is an application of anthropology, is looking at like um, evolutionary medicine uh, is like what the field is called. So kind of taking into account what are people's backgrounds, um, their population histories when we're trying to make like um, medical recommendations. Um, because I think for a long time, um, research was really focused on European populations, primarily white populations. Um, and what we're finding with a lot of anthropology is that um, what might be a base level for, um, you know, maybe the, the amount of fat in the blood of uh, someone from Europe is not the same um, as in other populations because of this different population history. Um, so I think that's one way that we could really apply this research into um, kind of medical access um, to people coming from different populations with different histories. Do you have anything to add to that? Really sure. Mean? I mean, I would say your your body um, can tolerate tremendous abuse um, in terms of what you eat. Um, for example, like there are some very extreme diets. Like um, there there is an idea of a diet where you eat only fruit, um, and which is unbelievably bad for you, but you that won't kill you very quickly. Um, you can you can survive on the most horrible unbalanced diets because your body can break down everything you eat into its component parts and then build what you need and they can do that for almost everything um so i would say that the problem of like living in this like food desert or um, not being able to get a balanced diet is basically your body having to go through this process um first it may be missing a few essential things which without you'll get sicker and sicker over time and then second it takes much more energy for your body to kind of build everything from scratch um, so I would say in general, you would kind of probably be more fatigued. Um, so I think, I mean, that's a horrible problem. I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm just a biologist um, and don't have to solve any societal problems because they're really tricky. <laughs> or yet, you don't have to solve them yet, right? Don't have to solve them yet. Right. I just do worms. Worms are easy. <laughs> they just, I know we're heading towards our, our ending time here, but there's a I, I an, an, a question that really caught my attention too from Jean Gallup in our audience, who says that the audience is predominantly female. Is this true of, uh, in your research field in general and any thoughts on why? I think that, yeah. Yeah, I, I can echo uh, Grace's comment in the chat here. Um, it's pretty similar in anthropology as well. I find that um, my undergrad, I was an archeologist. Um, and we were almost all female, the, the whole department, uh, I'm sorry, not the whole department, the whole undergraduate class. Um, but when we got to like the professor level, um, there were more male professors than there were female professors. So I think um, similar to what Grace said, that for some reason, the percentage of women does tend to go down over time. Um, but yeah, that seems to be something that has really changed at least um, from you know 30 years ago there's a lot more uh, a lot more women participating now and having more access I should say sure I would say one challenge that I think nobody's figured out um, is what do you you know um, there's there's a lot of um, how to, how should I put this a lot of encouragement to have a have a family um, like society societally but the um, there's a lot of really depressing research about how horrifyingly bad it is for your career as a female scientist to have a have an offspring. Um, yeah. So that's like a challenge. I and I, I wonder if that's why, um, you know, and typically I would say the average age of a graduate student is someone who is of childbearing years. So I wonder if that is an obstacle in trying to advance in the career um, that is that is more one one gender oriented. So, so you see, as a biologist, you can't avoid all the social issues around, but you, yeah, you're, I, doing, I would, you're doing the work for, for, you know, helping to create some solutions, I'm, I'm sure. I am 
yeah, I, I'm just a neuroscientist. I don't know how to solve yeah, that just, problem. Just a neuroscientist. Just a neuroscientist. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a couple of there's. I'll, I'll try to condense a couple of questions because I, I um, there was a question about um, somebody would love to know your thoughts on short short term positive epigenetic changes via diet and supplements, and also somebody got specific about your thoughts on taking supplements like Nareva for brain or memory function. So I, I guess in general, I'm very against any medication that hasn't been tested by the FDA. Um, I just, I have some personal bad experiences with my, uh, my grandparents being like really taken advantage of um, spending like money, lots and lots of money on things that I think were, were basically fake. Um, so I would just be really talk to a medical doctor about some of these things. Um, in terms of doing your own research, the, I, would, I would say you want to use this source called PubMed or Google Scholar. Um, that gives you actual scientific papers rather than news articles. Um, one of the things I actually do for my mom is sometimes she wants to know about these things and so she'll ask me um, to, to like look up some papers and try and interpret them. I think one really big problem that science has, just talking about supplements in general, is it's almost impossible for any, anyone to read a scientific paper who's not a scientist. And so if you want to do your own research, it's really incredibly difficult. And so um, I, I think that's just, that, that's why I would basically say in, in, instead of looking at something that's not a scientific resource to, to talk to your doctor. Um, yeah, I would say change your diet rather than take a supplement in general, if you can. Do you have any anything else to share on that? I see you in agreement. Yeah, I think uh, Grace covered that um, very, very well. And I think um, just in terms of the like epigenetic changes, as far as I know, I think um, there's not really that many confirmed cases of like real epigenetic change that occur like over a short period of time, unless it's in very, very um, like specific kind of extreme conditions. Like there's like an example of like the Dutch hunger winter where yeah. people were starving over a prolonged period of time. Um, I'm not sure if there would be changes like that, just, you know, via diet or supplements. I have my favorite example of this epigenetic change and it's, it's um, fitting because right now it's Ramadan. So there's some research that shows that um, if you were pregnant during Ramadan, your child is more likely to be obese. Which I think is really interesting. Wow. Huh. So like extreme fasting, yeah. I think is actually, I'm going to say it's bad for you, but that's with a quotation mark because I know intermittent fasting is very cool. Talk to your doctor. Well, I just can't tell you both of you. And, and I think I echo others in the audience who just say it's been a really interesting presentation and you've, you've given us a lot of information in a very short time period. So I will just add my thanks and then turn it over to Anne for the wrap up. Yeah, I think uh, thanks all around, Audrey, Grace, Shannon, um, for your uh, very informative, in incredibly informative talks tonight. I'd also like to thank Sunandini Chandra, uh, if you're still there, yes, you are, you're still there, who's been a true pleasure to liaise with at Yale Science Communications over the last six or so months. Um, and also a great big thanks out to uh, Gretchen Hochmeister, who is the director of the Hotchkiss Library out at Sharon, um, who is not here tonight, but will be with us, I hope, on uh, Saturday morning when we host another collaborative program on Bow Gardens. Um, and so uh, one last thank you to everybody else who came out tonight. Um, thank you for being in the audience and, and sharing your questions and your information with us. And I also would love to see you back here on June 21st when we have the next Yale Science Communication Program, the, the topic of which is still a mystery. So <laughs> watch our, our social media, um, our websites, our emails uh, for more information about that coming up on June 21st. Thank you all very much. Safe travels, stay warm, and enjoy the spring. Take care.